in LA this week. This is going to be for people who maybe who don't own, own a bike already. Well, the bikes aren't here yet, but the rental kiosk is. As downtown LA gets set for the official launch of downtown LA Metro's bike share program. I'm Gil Reyes at Union Station with the preview. New permanent supportive housing being built here in the city of Los Angeles, and this area is expected to be the hub of homeless services in the San Fernando Valley once completed. I'm Gil Reyes with a story next. I'm Rasha Goel. Up next, how the LAPD is becoming the greenest law enforcement agency in the nation. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yana Kay. Well, South LA just got on the map, the Promise Zone map, that is. Anna Marcos has more on a new Obama initiative that could bring more jobs, money, and opportunity to a long depressed area. The future just got a lot brighter for residents of South LA. The area near the Blue Expo and Crenshaw light rail lines has been designated a Promise Zone as part of President Barack Obama's Promise Zone initiative. Promise Zone status gives disadvantaged communities a hand up in economic development and access to federal grants, but it only happened after three tries and the community banding together. This was bigger than me or you or him or her. It was about our community. It was about the first grader that dreams of being a doctor, the single parent working multiple jobs to make ends meet, the senior citizen digging through the trash to collect recyclables so that he or she can put food on the table. Besides more access to federal grants, South LA will also get a federal liaison to help find funding opportunities and five AmeriCorps members to help area leaders plan a development strategy. The Obama administration believes in your vision. We believe in your potential. We believe in this community and we're here to help. The promise we invest in our young people, the next mayor is standing behind me, the next supervisor, member of Congress, the next community college, president or chancellor, the next surgeon, the next great businesswoman, the next great person who will help us see a brighter future is here. More than 50 schools and business and community organizations formed a coalition known as Slate Z and helped make the Promise Zone dream a reality. This is a perfect example of what can happen when we work together. Area leaders applaud South LA's new status, but say more needs to be done in an area with 45% poverty and 12% unemployment. I think I'm going to have to say to the HUD secretary, you still got to stretch it. You got to come further south. You started down that way, but you didn't get down to watch yet. You didn't get down to the Maxine Waters Employment Preparation Center yet. And so the work is never done. City leaders hope the Promise Zone status delivers on its promise, a better future for the community members and young students here. I'm Anna Margos for LA This Week. These promise zones are also getting a boost from the local level as Gil Reyes reports a city-sponsored hackathon challenged techies to figure out ways to improve those underserved areas. Technologist Stephen Corwin understands the drudgery of paperwork, especially when securing permits for building projects. So he's creating an app in hopes of simplifying things. Like a permit, for example, um, there's a standardized process that, uh, you know, and it involves paper forms that people have to go through in order to get that permit. And I had this thought, which was, well, what if we could just let people create, map out those steps digitally and tag the people that are responsible on them and let people sort of loop themselves into that process and launch it themselves rather than sending forms in the mail. That's the kind of creativity encouraged at this Hack for LA workshop. Innovators using technology, open data and design thinking to enhance city living. This year, the focus is on improving central LA, one of President Obama's specially designated Promise Zones. Promise Zones are underserved neighborhoods that receive top consideration for federal grants. This particular zone includes East Hollywood, MacArthur Park, and Koreatown. So I would just invite everybody to think about how technology could improve the lives in their community and to contact the city and let us know what is it that you have that's a great idea about how to help Los Angeles. Jean Holm is Assistant General Manager of the city's Information Technology Agency. ITA, a main supporter of this hackathon at Robert F. Kennedy Community School. 
Stephen Corwin's platform might one day speed up the process of building much needed affordable housing in East Hollywood. Well, that's the kind of stuff that we want to build here at Hack for LA, uh, and that's the kind of culture that we want to create. To improve life in our city, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. LA is the only city in the U.S. to have two promise zone designations within its boundaries. Well, permanent supportive housing is coming to the Valley with services on site to help keep people off the streets for good. Gil Reyes has more from North Hollywood. Gil. Yes, Yana, this planned permanent supportive housing complex in North Hollywood is the latest to break ground in the city of Los Angeles, and it comes at a time when the city and the county are collaborating on ways to build more of them, and more than likely, putting the issue before voters. Local leaders break ground on what could be a permanent solution to homelessness. It's more than just housing, it's permanent supportive housing. We uh, purchased this old motel in the early 80s. Next week, we're tearing it down to rebuild in its place a comprehensive service center, the campus at LA Family Housing, that will bring new housing, a new primary health care clinic. Stephanie Klasky Gamer of LA Family Housing talking about their soon to be opened campus off Lancashire Boulevard. 50 new units of permanent supportive housing that includes job placement, health, and addiction services on site to help ensure tenants are sober, employed, and off the streets for good. Though it may seem uncomfortable to see more of these complexes and their tenants popping up in your neighborhood, Mayor Eric Garcetti urges people to open up their hearts and minds. And we come out as a voice saying, actually, yes, please put this in my backyard. I'll tell you the concerns that I need, the good architecture I'd like to see, the safety I want to ensure that's there. But yes, bring this to my neighborhood so I don't have to see these people on the streets. We need to ensure that every part of our city has the resources and the ability to help everyone who finds themselves homeless. With homelessness up, local leaders are expected to ask us, the voters, to help pay for more housing. Possibilities include a sales tax increase, a housing bond, a millionaire's tax, taxes on marijuana or billboards. Voters could decide on one or more of these issues in November. Meantime, the mayor is urging people to be creative and proactive in housing the homeless. The campus is expected to open in late 2017. In North Hollywood, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Mayor Garcetti has approved $138 million in the upcoming fiscal year to battle homelessness. That's a fourfold increase from the previous year. Well, the city of L.A. is laying down the law on women's health and pregnancy issues. Rasha Goel has more on the steps being taken to ensure women are protected when it comes to their reproductive rights. City officials are working to ensure crisis pregnancy centers follow the law to help women get all the information they need on family planning options. Here in Los Angeles, we know that waiting for a day or a week or a month to enforce this law threatens the health and safety of women who during that time period may not be informed of their choices, may not be given accurate, complete and timely information. The law, known as the Reproductive Fact Act, took effect on January 1st and requires licensed facilities providing family planning or pregnancy related services to notify pregnant women that the state offers free or low cost access to a variety of family planning services, including prenatal care, abortion and contraception. Officials say that while some health clinics are reputable, others may not have their patients' best interest in mind. There are crisis centers, um, and these crisis centers are often deceptive. They make women believe that there are medical clinics or that they offer options for women who are pregnant, and they really don't. But there have been news accounts based on other investigations, other information, where women are told that if you have an abortion, you're more likely to get breast cancer or if you have an abortion, you may never be able to have kids again. The city attorney's office recently sent compliance notices to six pregnancy centers in Los Angeles to inform them of the law's requirements. The city attorney also mentioned he had no evidence that any of them have been violating the law. So we're going to be following up the dissemination of those notices with investigations to assure the law is in fact being fully effectuated 
by these so-called crisis pregnancy centers. Centers are required to post information about how to access a range of programs. They can provide the information by posting it, they can give a document to an individual, or they can show it to her digitally. Pregnancy centers that fail to follow the law could face a $500 fine for the first offense and $1,000 for each subsequent violation. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The city attorney encourages pregnant women to contact his office at 213-978-8340 if they believe they have received inaccurate or incomplete information about their options. While the celebrations for LGBTQ Heritage Month continue, and in Hollywood, a museum exhibit shines the spotlight on the contributions made by the gay and lesbian community in Tinseltown. And Marcos takes us there. This exhibit truly showed its colors. The Real to Real exhibit at the Hollywood Museum marked its third time here, a show that highlights how gays in the LGBT community are portrayed in TV and movies. I'm an LGBT activist myself. Besides being on uh, Child of the 70s is a LGBT themed um, web series and now it's on Out TV. The exhibit also featured the work that gays have contributed to the industry, from costume designers to actors to musical artists. And we hope that you will have a chance to see the Cindy Lauper exhibit this evening. As many of you know, she is a tireless, longtime activist to gay rights movement. Many here felt this was also a celebration of all gays after the great strides towards equality made by the LGBT community in recent years. Two years ago, when we opened this exhibit the first time, we did not have nationwide recognition of equality and the freedom to marry. Now it is the law of the land. Celebrities also came out, including Tony winner and fashion icon Julie Newmar. When I found out why they invited me to welcome you to the LGBT exhibit, I was told at one point or another, most of you in this room had dressed up as me. <laughs> touched. You have good taste. But even with the party atmosphere, community leaders reminded listeners that as the transgender bathroom issue rages, there's still a lot of work to be done in the fight for true equality and acceptance. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. Well, it sounds like science fiction. A downtown LA company is trying to bring public transit near the speed of sound to the world. Gil Reyes reports on the Hyperloop and how it could influence urban planning in Los Angeles. It's SpaceX founder Elon Musk's futuristic idea for high-speed transit. Not by rail, not by road, but on tubes. Inside these vacuum tubes would be capsules, shuttling passengers at 760 miles per hour. Welcome to the future. Welcome to Hyperloop. A lot of people, um, and rightly so, still think this is a, a science fiction idea. Uh, but actually, we're going to have a full-scale, full-speed prototype running by the end of this year. Hyperloop One co-founder Brogan Bambrogan speaking with other tech innovators at the Milken Global Conference in Beverly Hills. Also on the panel, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti. He says Hyperloop and other futuristic transport systems like self-driving cars could, for starters, reduce L.A.'s soul-sucking traffic. We love in L.A. this idea we're going to have freedom trapped in a car moving at three miles an hour. That's not freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment that, you know, a new generation sh shows us differently, the way it isn't just about transportation, it's going to free up the way we do urban planning. He says fewer cars could free up L.A. parking lots for development. The city could build more housing, making the cost of housing more affordable. Hyperloop One is headquartered in downtown L.A.'s Arts District and is one of several companies competing for the privilege of launching Hyperloop the brainchild of SpaceX and Tesla CEO Elon Musk. Much of the hype over Hyperloop centers on passenger transport, shuttling people from L.A. to San Francisco in 30 minutes. 
But Bam Brogan also mentions transporting goods to and from the port of L.A. in record speed. Now you can maybe double the efficiency of that same <clears throat> port, um, also making it easier on the local community without the pollution, um, being unrestrictive of right of way, so maybe you have less trucks on the road. The goal is to have a fully operational Hyperloop by 2020. Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. Rival companies have differing opinions over the best propulsion system for Hyperloop shuttles. One idea is magnetic levitation, another is air pressure. Well, with the LA Rams about to make the LA Coliseum their home for a while, officials are talking trash and the effort to keep the waste from piling up. Thousands of LA Rams fans are set to flock to the LA Coliseum for the highly anticipated football season. And when the game is over, the only thing left will be trash and tons of it. But instead of hauling the trash to the landfills, officials have come up with a game plan. It's called the Zero Waste Program, an effort that seeks to cut the amount of trash that ends up in those landfills. It's a way for us to really create a more sustainable environment. Trash company Athens Waste Services, City of LA and stadium operator USC will work together to make sure the different kinds of trash is fully recyclable and ready for composting. We help the recycler where people do the normal thing. Everything else we take to one of our plants, we separate all the valuable recyclables and then if we choose to, we can take them to a facility that will transfer all of the residual waste into energy. The Coliseum plans to start using different food packaging materials so that nothing goes to waste. Those items that we use to package all of the things that you get, your hot dog wrappers, your nacho trays, your condiment boats, all of those things need to be based in a fiber form if we're going to be able to get a benefit out of it. Officials say recycling bins and other trash containers will be available for fans to dispose their trash and Athens Waste will take care of the rest. Officials say between 7 and 10 tons of trash is generated after each football game. Well, it's the new way to get around town downtown L.A. to be exact, as Metro gets set to launch its bike share program in one of L.A.'s hippest and fastest growing communities. Gil Reyes has more from downtown. The very first kiosk in L.A. Metro's bike share program, which officially kicks off on Thursday, July 7th. There will be 65 rental kiosks just like this one throughout the downtown L.A. area all of them conveniently placed at or near transit stops. The point is to get more metro commuters to bicycle instead of drive to and from transit stops and ditch their cars as much as possible. This is going to be for people who maybe who don't own, own a bike already. So. It's also for downtown visitors like Elijah Cathaway. He and his pals could rent bikes here after arriving at Union Station, then bicycle and drop them off at 64 other rental kiosks throughout downtown. Kiosks will be located at popular destinations like the Broad Museum, the Arts District, and Chinatown. They'll also sit within walking distance of transit stops. So between riding metro and cycling, he never has to drive a car. Bike share pass holders pay 20 bucks a month for unlimited half hour rentals. And starting in August, you can rent at the kiosk by credit card. $3.50 for a half hour ride. I think we're at that tipping point in the city of LA where, you know, for a long time it was so car centric. Now we're promoting more alternative forms of transportation, uh, more light rail, uh, more bikes, more pedestrian activity in our streets. And that's a good thing for the environment. It's a good thing for our health. It's a good thing all around to alleviate our, our roads. Downtown Councilman Jose Huizar goes on a preview ride. In preparation for Metro Bike Share in July, the city has added protective bike lanes with barriers to shield cyclists on a stretch of Los Angeles Street. More of these protective bike lanes are expected on Main and Spring Streets down the road. In downtown L.A., I'm Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. There will be a thousand bikes available for rent in the downtown L.A. area starting in July. All 65 kiosks will be open 24 hours a day. Get your bike share pass at metro.net slash bike share. LAPD is going green. The initiative is part of the city's sustainable plan to have more than half of new city vehicles to be fully electric by next year. Rasha Goel has more. Rasha. Yana, I'm here in downtown Los Angeles where officials have announced 
the addition of 100 new electric vehicles to the LAPD fleet. Now, these vehicles are being leased for three years, and they cost about $387 a month, which covers their repairs, maintenance costs, and operational costs. Officials also fill us in on why these vehicles will be a huge added benefit for the city and for the LAPD. They have no internal combustion engine, so they will emit zero pollution, require no gasoline whatsoever. So the air of Los Angeles is cleaned up. And with every single existing LAPD uh, vehicle that we take off the road and replace with one of these electric vehicles, we eliminate tailpipe emissions, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by an estimated 76% overall. These BMW i3 all-electric plug-in vehicles will be used for certain LAPD functions. The majority of the cars operated by the Los Angeles Police Department are not black and white uh, patrol vehicles. The majority of our fleet are made for detectives, are used by our civilian, our 3,000 civilian employees in doing the day-to-day -day business of the city and the day-to-day -day policing of the city. They're not going to be for emergencies or for pursuit. The cost for leasing the 100 cars is about $1.4 million, with an additional $1.5 million for the infrastructure to charge the BMWs and other electric vehicles purchased in the future. Normally, we keep the uh, sedans uh, of this class for six years in operation. So what we're looking to do is use the vehicles. The lease is for 36 months, three years, at almost zero cost maintenance and practically zero cost uh, using fossil fuel. The LAPD's I-3 deal could lead to a deal for vehicles more appropriate for patrol work. Police Chief Charlie Beck says the department is continuing to work with BMW, Tesla and other automakers to create a more capable electric vehicle. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Mayor Eric Garcetti says the city plans to acquire 100 additional electric vehicles this fiscal year. Well, an oil facility in South L.A. faces more stringent oversight after a lawsuit settlement honoring the contributions of immigrants in the U.S. and time to make a splash as the summer swim season kicks into high gear. All these stories in City Beat. City Attorney Mike Fuhrer announced that he has secured a court order that puts in place important protections for the South LA community and environment in regulating the Allen Co. oil facility, which according to Fuhrer put the health and safety of residents at risk. The court order details specific regulations and further approvals that Allen Co. must follow and obtain before it's ever to reopen and begin pumping oil again. Allen Co. is also required to provide a state-of-the-art environmental safety monitoring system and pay $1.25 million in civil penalties. We sued Allen Co. to protect the people living in the surrounding community. Low-income people, people who very rarely have someone standing up for them. Councilmember Gil Cedillo introduced the resolution designating June as Immigrant Heritage Month, a nationwide effort to gather, share, and celebrate inspirational stories of immigration in the U.S. and the individuals, families, and communities who have contributed to the country's unique social diversity. We believe here that it's important to create a sense of comfort, a sense of being welcome, a sense of unity, a sense of solidarity. The Department of Recreation and Parks, Councilmember Curran Price, and Bureau of Engineering kicked off the 2016 summer swim season with the reopening of the Central Pool and Kaiser Permanente's Operation Splash program, which provides swim lessons for children and adults in low-income areas. The Central Pool at 22nd Street was damaged in the 1994 Northridge earthquake and closed its doors in 2004. Two years ago, it began a multi-million dollar renovation that now includes a children's splash area. I'm having such a great time with my daughter, spending time and it's very, I feel grateful to know that we have programs here for the summer. While keeping animals at the LA Zoo well fed sometimes requires creative solutions. As Rich Samuels explains, a new collaboration with a local nonprofit is making some animals very happy. Our non native plants feed their non native animals. The Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy is in the midst of a habitat restoration project, and that means acacia has got to go. The animals don't use it as much as they would use the, the local native flora. Um, so 
they they actually block out any other plants from growing underneath them and they spread pretty uh, rambunctiously. They're also very flammable. So with the help of a team from AmeriCorps, a federally funded public service organization, the acacia are being removed and replaced with native vegetation. That's good news for native plants and great news for the LA Zoo. The acacia is something that we can use at the zoo to feed to a lot of the different animals. Everything from monkeys on up to giraffes loves to eat acacia. While the zoo grows some of its own food, it depends on community partnerships like these to meet the demands of zoo residents. In addition to giraffes and monkeys, elephants, antelopes, and a wide range of other animals also enjoy acacia. From the Alta Vicente Reserve in Rancho Palos Verdes, this is Rich Samuels for LA This Week. The Habitat Restoration Project is ongoing, which means there's more good eating in store for our friends at the LA Zoo. While emerging LA artists showcase their work, get up close and personal with the beauty of modern design, and a view of the city that'll literally take your breath away. All this in this week's Things to Do. The Hammer Museum's biannual exhibition series Made in LA focuses exclusively on artists from the LA region with an emphasis on emerging and under-recognized artists. The Los Angeles Biennial debuts new installations, videos, films, sculptures, performances and paintings commissioned specifically for the exhibition and offers insight into the current trends and practices coming out of Los Angeles one of the most active and energetic art communities in the world. The Hammer Museum is located at 10899 Wilshire Boulevard. For more, visit hammer.ucla.edu. It's America's largest modern design event. Dwell on Design is a three-day exhibition and conference comprised of one trade day and two consumer days at the Los Angeles Convention Center, featuring world-class speakers, product demonstrations, continuing education classes for design professionals, and seminars for design-seeking consumers. For more information, visit la.dwellondesign.com. Sky Space LA boasts a thrill experience unlike any other. Sky Slide, an outdoor glass slide positioned nearly 1,000 feet above downtown LA. The Sky Slide is 45 feet long, approximately 4 feet wide, and made entirely with 1 and a quarter inch thick glass. Visitors will experience Sky Slide's unparalleled views in a whole new way as they glide from the 70th to the 69th floor of the U.S. Bank Tower. From interactive and educational components to the spectacular design, Sky Space LA is the ideal family-friendly attraction and the tallest open-air observation deck. It opens on Saturday, June 25th and located at 633 West 5th Street. For more, visit skyspace-la.com. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. <laughs>